If you love liberty, declare your independence by signing the Shire Society Declaration at ShireSociety.com. Um, yeah, we're going to get started uh, here. So my name is Daniel Ponto. I'm the community organizer of ACLU New Hampshire. And it's so great to see this uh, awesome turnout for, for this Know Your Rights event. This is definitely uh, probably the largest uh, Know Your Rights event that we've done um, to this day. So excellent to, to be here with you all. Um, I'm going to let G, uh, G take it off, but uh, just a couple of logistical notes. We do have two restrooms over here. They're gender neutral, so you can use either one. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's it. So the agenda for today is Jules uh, uh, will go through kind of uh, a PowerPoint presentation on what your rights are and uh, other uh, educational and informational things related to immigration. And then we'll do a, a model, we'll kind of model um, these scenarios for you all. Uh, and like kind of acted out uh, up here uh, on, on the stage for you, just so you can kind of get the feel of uh, what these checkpoints look like um, and how it feels to be um, at these checkpoints if you haven't gone through one before. And then um, Next Gen uh, New Hampshire will help us out with a, a sign making event. Um, there are some people who want to make some signs uh, to put on the cars for when the, the next point comes. Uh, next checkpoint. Uh, is set up uh, to warn people up ahead that, you know, that there's a checkpoint and they to give them a chance to to exit. So yeah, with that, uh, I'll give it to Gilles. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Dan. Uh, and, and just to echo what Dan said, it's this is really an amazing turnout. And uh, on behalf of the ACLU and the other organizations sponsoring this, thank you so much. And I think the fact that we have such a large turnout is really a reflection of the real concern that Granite Staters have. Um, about uh, these checkpoints. Uh, and before I start, I just want to thank uh, the community organizers and folks in our office at the ACLU who helped logistically put this event on. Dan, Ali Schwartz, uh, AFSC uh, is a sponsor of this event, and as well as NextGen. So thank you, thank you to those organizations uh, for helping put this on today. There's always a lot of logistics that go into events like this. Um, my name is uh, Gilles Bissonnette, as I said, or I may not have said. I'm the legal director for the ACLU of New Hampshire. Uh, and what that means is I go to court, uh, in both state courts and federal courts here in New Hampshire, litigating the ACLU civil liberties cases. Uh, and it really is, I think, the best job in the world. As I like to say, I, I sue the government for a living, which is pretty cool. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, that, you know, for folks who don't know about the ACLU, we litigate on a whole host uh, of legal issues, uh, voting rights issues, free speech issues, reproductive rights issues, LGBT issues, uh, criminal justice reform issues, uh, and the like. And it's a really exciting organization to work for, and we're very busy uh, these days, including uh, on the subject that we're talking about today, immigration checkpoints. And I'll touch upon, uh, as we go through our Know Your Rights, this Know Your Rights presentation, uh, a case that we actually litigated concerning the August 2017 checkpoint that occurred here uh, in New Hampshire. So why don't we just go to the next slide, Dan. So I think if anyone who's read the newspaper <laughs> or uh, follows news online knows that we've seen uh, in the past 18 months an expansion, uh, a fairly significant expansion of immigration enforcement, uh, not only in the United States, just nationally on the southern border, but also here in New England. Uh, and so some of the things that you may have read about that I think are examples of this, uh, expanding who is targeted for detention and deportation. Originally, it used to be uh, individuals who had committed crimes that rendered them eligible for uh, removal. That has since, uh, that policy has since been changed uh, to really anyone who is eligible for deportation or removal, regardless of or, uh, whether they're a danger or not. Um, We've also seen increased resources being sent to ICE and Border Patrol. These checkpoints are a prime example of that. These checkpoints did not occur regularly in New Hampshire, um, but uh, within the last 18 months, we've seen a real uh, a surge in how often they've occurred. We've seen expanded cooperation with local police uh, among immigration officials. We're seeing that in some parts of the state, uh, particularly in, 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 in some towns in the southern tier. Uh, we've seen the travel ban. Uh, which uh, was litigated by the ACLU unsuccessfully um, at the Supreme Court uh, last month. Uh, and we see the revocation of the DACA program. Uh, and there's, there's many others, but I won't, I won't get into the details because today, next slide, we're talking about uh, immigration checkpoints. So there have been changes at the national level around immigration enforcement. Um, as I said, we're seeing that here. 
Um, in addition to Border Patrol checkpoints, we've seen it with respect to uh, the efforts by the federal government to immediately deport uh, uh, members of the Indonesian community in the seacoast area. Uh, a group of individuals uh, who had pre uh, arrangements with federal immigration officials to regularly check in. And as part of that program, they came out of the shadows. Uh, they were not permitted, they, they weren't eligible to stay in the country if they committed crimes. They were required to regularly report. And with the change in administration, that program was really ripped out of, uh, from underneath these folks. And they were told within 30 days that, uh, that they were going to have to take a plane back to Indonesia. Uh, and so we, we fortunately, on behalf of the ACLU and other folks, including the law firm Mix and Pete, we were able to uh, secure a stay of that deportation order, and it's now at the First Circuit. So that is just, I think, yet another example, checkpoints aside, of, of uh, some of the things that we're seeing um, in this state. So with respect to checkpoints, I just want to give the standard caveat for the lawyers in the room. Uh, <laughs> lawyers understand why I'm doing this. Uh, this presentation is not intended to uh, be legal advice or a substitute for legal advice. It's a presentation that just tells you what your basic, basic rights are. If you have specific questions, you should contact an attorney. Um, as to the next slide, I just want to talk about common terms. Um, because I know some people in the room just may not be familiar uh, with some of the acronyms that I may use from time to time. And they, they can be confusing. So I want to talk about three branches of immigration law enforcement. The first is Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Uh, this is what is known as ICE. What is ICE? ICE is basically the Immigration Police, and they operate within the interior of the United States. CP, CBP, I always mix up the B and the P, I, I like constantly. I did it in court all the time uh, recently. That's Customs and Border Patrol. What do they do? They operate on the border, uh, but not just the, the U.S.-Canadian border or the U.S.-Mexico border. They actually can operate along the perimeter of the entire country. That, that includes the coastlines as well. Sorry for the whiny dog. Uh, uh, are you hearing that? No? Okay, well, never mind. I'll leave that in order. Um, they also operate, you should note, at ports of entry. So that would be uh, major international airports where people are coming in from foreign countries. And lastly, Citizenship and Immigration Services. Uh, we're not going to be talking about them as much, but what they do is process immigration paperwork, they process, process passports, etc. Uh, next slide, Cynthia. Thanks. Uh, common terms, lawyer, we all know what lawyers are, a person who is permitted to practice law, a judge, a public official appointed or elected to decide cases in court, a criminal, a person who has committed a crime, and a legal, that is an act that someone has done contrary to or forbidden by law. Uh, Undocumented, individuals not having appropriate legal documentation, uh, in, in this case the state in the United States. Order of removal, that's a deportation notice. It is a legal decision by a judge uh, that a person is to be removed from the United States. And lastly, a warrant, and that's a document giving immigration police or law enforcement the authority to make an arrest. A warrant can also be a document uh, issued uh, uh, giving uh, law enforcement the ability to uh, search you or seize your property. Uh, it's okay. Uh, I, so I, it's okay, I'll just keep going through the next slide. So what the next slide would say, uh, there's a few other terms that, that we may be getting to, uh, and that's uh, a raid. We've all heard, heard about immigration officials conducting raids. Uh, oftentimes at certain places of employment. Uh, a raid is, uh, uh, I like to use the phrase, an attack. It's an attack to identify or arrest individuals who are undocumented by law enforcement. An arrest, that's a seizure of a person by legal authority to take someone into custody. A search and seizure, and that's at issue with respect to checkpoints, that's a procedure used by police or other authorities to search one's property or place uh, of business and take any evidence relevant that they suspect uh, may be uh, the nexus, uh, may have a nexus to criminal activity. And one term you're also going to hear me use is consent. And that is, what that means is giving permission for someone uh, to uh, search property. Uh, that's mostly, in fact, the context in which we're going to be using it. 
And next would be the slide is who could be at risk of removal at checkpoints. So that's the prior slide. Let's go back one more. Thank you. So uh, who could be at risk uh, at checkpoints? Three categories of folks. First, people who have been ordered to be deported. The second category would be people uh, without papers or without lawful immigration status. And third would be anyone who is not a U.S. citizen and who has had contact with the criminal justice system. What do I mean by that? Someone who may have had lawful status but, but now effectively loses that status because there may be an allegation or that, uh, that, that the person has committed a crime or most likely that person has been convicted of a crime that renders them eligible for removal. So those are individuals that may have issues with their status uh, and uh, could be subject to repercussions uh, at these checkpoints um, as they're engaging uh, Border Patrol officials. So now let's just talk about the checkpoints in general. Uh, let's kind of get into the heart of, of, of what we've been seeing in New Hampshire. So CPB recommenced temporary immigration checkpoints in Woodstock, New Hampshire in August of 2017. Now we hadn't seen checkpoints at that location for a, a significant period. There was one in 2012. I think that was the only one uh, that I'm at least I'm aware of between 2009 and 2017. Uh, I believe there were some examples of that checkpoint being used uh, post 9-11, but there was a, a, a significant gap where these checkpoints weren't really occurring, and instead I think those resources were predominantly placed in uh, in or around the, the southern border. But as I said before, with the new administration, we've seen uh, a lot of resources thrown at this issue, and that has meant the increased use of temporary checkpoints now in New England. We have also saw one recently on, I believe, I-95 uh, in Maine, in the Bangor area. Uh, four checkpoints have been conducted at this location. As I said, they started in August 2017. There was one uh, one month later in September 2017, and then there were two this year on, on holiday weekends, May 2017 during Memorial Day, and June 27 on Father's Day weekend. So I guess they like the Border Patrol likes to choose popular holiday weekends to conduct uh, these checkpoints. We do expect four more this year. Uh, why do I say that? Uh, because we obtained, through a public records request, a communication between the state police and Border Patrol that was drafted earlier this year before the Memorial Day checkpoint in which uh, Border Patrol said that there were six checkpoints planned. Well, we've, had, we've seen two since then, so I think the expectation is there might be four going forward, which is why I'm so excited that you're all here today, because I think we anticipate more activity in the future, and it's very important uh, that people know what their rights are, of course, when they go through these checkpoints. Who's been to Woodstock here? Wow. Uh, who, uh, who has gone through these checkpoints here? One, two, three, four, five, so maybe about five or six, okay. Um, at some point, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, uh, on, on what your experience was like. I have some thoughts of my own that I'll get into, of course. Um, uh, and uh, we've seen some video that we're gonna talk a little bit about, about these checkpoints that, that concern, concern us with respect to how they've been conducted. But for those folks who've gone to Woodstock, which seems like most of the people in the room, population 1,300, very small town, on the southern end of the White Mountains, and of course, that is a corridor for people to uh, enjoy the beauty of New Hampshire and go into the mountains. And so, I think this this place is very strategically located uh, by immigration officials to capture uh, to capture folks who are uh, uh, going up to to the northern part of the state. But I would note, of course, that Woodstock is not at the border. Um, Woodstock is 90 driving miles uh, from the border. And so this is what I'm going to be talking about a little, uh, a little bit as well, is that um, Border Patrol has a very expansive view of what actually the border is. Um, so I'll be getting to that in a moment. Go to the next slide, Sanyo. So I know I mentioned this before, but I want to talk a little bit about it. Um, uh, there was an ACLU, uh, ACLU lawsuit about the uh, checkpoints that occurred uh, back in 2017. And in that lawsuit, and this resulted in a decision back uh, from two to three months ago, a circuit court judge held that the August 2017 checkpoint was unconstitutional because 
Border Patrol worked in concert with the local Woodstock Police Department to circumvent the independent protections provided by the New Hampshire Constitution. Uh, and these are specific pr protections that bar the use of dog sniff searches, which is what CPB was doing. Um, you can't, under the New Hampshire Constitution, conduct a dog sniff search in the absence of a warrant or reasonable suspicion. That's, of course, what's happening at these checkpoints, the running dogs uh, along every car that stopped during the checkpoints. Here's what the court said. Given that the defendants in this matter, these are our clients, there were 16 individuals, um, are facing prosecution in state court for violation of state laws, the constitutional protections of the New Hampshire Constitution should apply. The inadmissibility of this evidence does not change based on the fact that it was seized by federal officers and then handed over to the state. That was the argument. So what federal officials were saying is, well, you know, we are allowed to conduct dog sniffs. And all we're doing is just handing it over to the state. Uh, now, even though the state officials themselves can't conduct dog sniffs. So it was a clever <laughs> way around the New Hampshire Constitution. Uh, and the court saw right through it, right? And said, you just, this is a clever little scheme designed to circumvent the New Hampshire, New Hampshire Constitution. We're not going to tolerate that. Uh, particularly when we're in state court where the New Hampshire Constitution applies. Um, and this was a clear violation of the New Hampshire Constitution. Go to the next slide. Um, so what ultimately the court concluded was that the alleged contraband obtained from docs and searches couldn't be used in state court prosecutions. So that effectively is the ruling. That doesn't necessarily mean, however, that dog sniffs aren't going to be conducted going forward or that they can't be conducted going forward, however. And I think that's something to make clear. CPB still may use dog sniffs so long as any evidence, uh, that should be evidence, not evidenced, sorry, uh, evidence seized is used in federal court, not uh, state court from these dog sniffs. Uh, but I want to, there's another important caveat to that, however, and that's the primary purpose of the dog sniff search must be immigration related. And I wrote, I have a note on the slide that said this is still questionable. Why, why do I say that? Uh, I think we all know why dogs are being used. Right? <laughs> They're being used for drug purposes. Now to get around that, what Border Patrol will say, and they said when we questioned them in our case, we had a suppression hearing, they said, well the dogs, yeah, they, they detect, they smell drugs, they detect drugs, but it's, that's not the primary purpose, of course. The primary purpose is immigration related. We said, well, how is it immigration related? Well, these dogs can detect concealed humans. Oh. So that's, how they get around, that's how they try to get around this rule. So we asked, oh, well, that's interesting. Um, how, uh, you know, uh, CPB Agent X, how many concealed humans has your dog ever detected this past year? Zero. Has your dog ever detected a concealed human? No. That line of questioning with all of our witnesses, right? So. Uh, so I think it's important that people recognize that under the Fourth Amendment, these searches, these sniffs must be for immigration purposes, but I think in practice, the notion that the primary purpose isn't drug-related to me is, it, it's, it's kind of far-fetched. Um, I'll go to the next slide. So what's the problem? And, and this is um, certainly the ACLU's position, and I don't want to assume it's the position of everyone in this room. Um, but it, it is certainly my position that these are problematic from a civil liberties perspective. Um, and that's because during these checkpoints, hundreds if not thousands of people, right, are being seized, detained, and interrogated by federal government officials with guns, with badges, without any suspicion or probable cause that a crime has been committed. And to me, that's, you know, for people on either side of the spectrum, I think that's just normatively troubling. And uh, it's really something that our country typically hasn't been about, right? We, you know, normally when we think about searches and seizures and our interactions with the government, we don't tolerate law enforcement without any sus reasonable suspicion. We don't tolerate them stopping you and interrogating you. Um, and so we've always found this practice concerning We'll get into what the cases say about this practice, but that, that is really our chief concern. Because what these, ex these experiences do is, I think, fly in the face of what it means to live in a free society. Because normally, people don't have to answer to government officials as they're going about their personal business. We have a right to be free in our own country. That's, that's our view. Um, and so for folks who are interested in, in the ACLU's advocacy on this, 
Um, we are asking for individuals to uh, contact their congressional delegation because uh, I think they could they uh, they should be more vocal against these checkpoints. Uh, and I uh, would also uh, encourage folks to contact uh, the governor's office uh, and let them know your position if you share the concerns that the ACLU has on this issue. Uh, next slide, if you don't mind, Dan. Thanks. So let's talk about the 100-mile border zone. So I referenced this a, a, a little bit ago. Have you all heard about this yeah. issue, the 100-mile border zone? I'm not surprised. <laughs> this is a self-selecting group, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so let's talk about the 100-mile uh, border zone. What's the authority for these checkpoints? So even in places far removed from the border, deep into the interior of the country, immigration officials enjoy broad, though not limitless, and that's important, powers. Specifically, federal regulations give CPB the authority to operate within 100 miles of any U.S. quote, external boundary. So in this zone, Border, border Patrol have certain additional uh, powers. For instance, Border Patrol can operate immigration checkpoints. And it's important to note with this, within this 100 mile border zone, I think we all know that a lot of people live on the coasts in the United States, right? Two thirds or 200 million individuals live within this 100 mile uh, uh, zone. And I should note as well that it occupies all of New Hampshire. Just think about it, right? A hundred miles from, uh, say, the, the Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, Canadian border, you know, probably gets you just south of Woodstock, right? Well, then you look at what's a hundred miles from the seacoast area. That probably covers almost all of the southern part of the state, right? So New Hampshire is really uniquely situated such that under these policies, it's the state, I think, is almost exclusively or uh, in total captured um, under this regime. Uh, next slide. So this is for the legal, how many lawyers do we have in the room here? Oh, we have quite a few, okay. So for those of you who are interested in where I get my information, these are the sites. Um, this has been, I keep this slide handy because the, the media's been talking, to, they've been calling me a lot about this issue and, and this is really where it comes from. So the, it, this comes from a law passed by Congress in 1952 and it authorizes Border Patrol agents without a warrant within a, re quote, reasonable distance from any external boundary of the United States to board and search for aliens, any vehicle for the purpose of patrolling the border to prevent illegal entry of aliens into the United States. So then the question becomes, what does reasonable distance mean? And this has been defined by the federal government to mean within 100 air miles from any external boundary of the United States. Now the question is, you have to follow the links, right? What does external boundary mean? And this is the key part. The land boundaries and the territorial sea of the United States extending 12 nautical miles from the baselines of the United States determined in accordance with international law. So 12 nautical miles from, say, the seacoast, and then 88 miles inland. So again, it captures almost the entire uh, state, if not the entire state. So that's where when you hear about the zone, that's the legal authority from which it comes. So now I think this is the most important part of the presentation. And it's what are the rules during these checkpoints? What can immigration officials do? What can you do? And I think perhaps more importantly, what actually happens in practice at these checkpoints? And so here it goes. So long as the checkpoint's location and purpose satisfy the Fourth Amendment, Border Patrol may briefly, I have that underlined it, underlined and capped for a reason, briefly stop vehicles at certain checkpoints to do two things. And that's first, to ask a few limited questions to verify citizenship of the vehicle's occupants. So that's the driver and any passengers. This isn't limited to the driver. And two, visually inspect the exterior of the vehicle. Uh, and the, this, this comes from a case, if you've seen some of the videos, actually, Border Patrol talks about this case a lot, actually, at the checkpoints. This comes from a case called United States versus Martinez Fuerte, um, and that's from 1976. And there, the court ruled that immigration checkpoints were permissible only insofar as they involve a brief detention of travelers during which 
All that is required of the vehicle's occupants is a response to a brief question or two, and possibly the production of a document evidencing a right to be in the United States. That last part I'm not going to get into if you want with respect to uh, a document evidencing a right to be in the United States. That is actually incredibly complicated. Uh, and if you want to talk to me at the side, I'm happy to. Um, but but I'll, I'll avoid that here for the moment. Um, let me, let, let's go back to that slide real quick. Because I, 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 this is a bad case, OK? <laughs> um, and the, the rationale for, for this decision, I'm going to go off script a little bit. <laughs> so, the rationale for this decision was that federal immigration officials need to have this authority because individuals illegally cross the border and then they use their freeways to kind of migrate towards the interior of the United States. And the, and the idea at the time was um, we don't have a very robust uh, it, we don't have very robust immigration police to monitor that, so checkpoints kind of serve that purpose. I think in the 1970s, uh, I had to double check this, but there, there might have been you know, a thousand federal immigration police agents in the United States. And so this was kind of an economical way to use their, their authority. That's not the case now, right? How many immigration officials do we have? Do, do we know? About 20,000. Uh, it's the largest police force in the United States. This, to me, th this notion of the 100-mile zone that was implemented in the 50s and then was subsequently defined by regulation and the Martinez-Forte decision in 1976, to me, is just so incredibly antiquated, right? And that rule was created during a very antiquated time where there weren't the resources that currently exist with respect to immigration enforcement. Um, so I just kind of want to highlight that and just give kind of a little bit of historical context um, because I'm not sure the folks who were on the Supreme Court in 1976, if they knew how this was being used now, I don't think they, they would have been as maybe cavalier as they were in 1976 about the degree of intrusion that occurs during these checkpoints. Um, they put these rules in place kind of under the theory and rationale, well, you know, we're going to limit the inquiry that Border Patrol agents can engage in. Uh, but this really isn't that significant of an intrusion, was, was the court's view. Well, you know, I think what we're seeing right now is federal immigration officials taking this authority, latching onto it, and then, pump, and then pumping it up with steroids, right? Um, and that ultimately, as, as I think, what's so problematic and what makes these decisions, I think, a little bit more antiquated. Uh, but they are, of course, the law and the land, and my job to, to educate you about what those, what those decisions say. Um, so that's my two cents. Uh, go to the next slide, if you don't mind. Border Patrol cannot search the interior of a vehicle without the owner's consent or probable cause. What's probable cause? A reasonable belief, based on circumstances, that an immigration violation or crime uh, has likely occurred. So, they can't search your car unless they can meet these two exceptions. Often, they will ask, can I search your car? What do you say? No. Let's, let's say that again. No. No, no. We get a very, very good audience here who knows their rights. Uh, you don't have to consent to anything. No matter what they say, no matter how, how much you're pressured, uh, you don't have to do that. The site from the Martinez-Forte decision was on page 560 for those who are legal nerds um, about this limitation. Neither vehicles nor occupants should be searched, and referrals to secondary inspection areas only uh, areas should involve, quote, routine and limited inquiry into residence status only. Next slide. Let's talk about canines, though, because I think this is important because we, we're seeing canines quite a bit during the um, during these checkpoints, and it, it led to obviously litigation in state court that the ECLU uh, was involved in. Uh, let me just grab my notes here. Um, so, agents may be able to obtain probable cause for a search if a dog, dog, uh, if a dog, drug sniffing dog legitimately quote alerts to the presence of drugs. I use the term legitimately for a reason. This isn't something that you necessarily should challenge immigration officials on, okay, uh, 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 if you go through these checkpoints. But it's something that 
uh, lawyers like me are thinking about a lot with respect to how these, uh, how these checkpoints are conducted. If Border Patrol uses a drug sniffing dog and falsely claims that the dog has alerted to the presence of drugs or contraband in your vehicle, I just ask that you kind of internally in a notepad after this experience record as much of the information, as much information as you can about the incident and report it. Call my office because I'd like to actually, these are things that I'd like to learn about um, as they're occurring. A canine, I, I kind of mentioned the term legitimately. Here's why. A canine alert can provide agents with probable cause for a search under the cases only if the reliability of the dog and the handler are established. Okay, again, not something for people going to the checkpoint to worry about. This is for us kind of lawyers to think about after an issue, after, uh, after there's been an inter interaction uh, with Border Patrol. Uh, because what we know, in practice, we have some examples of Border Patrol canines often falsely alerting to non-existent contraband. This actually happened uh, during the August 2017 checkpoint. Um, so uh, I'm very suspicious of, of, of the use of canines, as you might imagine. But you should know if, uh, you know, if an officer says their canine alerted, alerted you, alerted, asks you to leave the car so they can search, you may have objections, that's fine. You, you feel free to say you don't consent, but follow instructions, okay? Follow instructions and then report the incident, okay? That's the way to properly handle it. Challenging law enforcement, I, I generally don't think is a good strategy, but we'll talk about uh, strategies to how to invoke your rights in the next few slides. Agents may send any vehicle to a secondary inspection area for the same purpose. Brief, again, brief. Brief questioning and visual inspection. Again, this came up in the Martinez Forte decision. Referrals to secondary inspection areas should be, quote, made for the sole purpose of conducting a routine and limited inquiry into resident status that cannot feasibly be made of every motorist where the traffic is heavy. Next slide. Agents should not, under the martinez Forte decision, ask questions unrelated to verifying citizenship, nor can they hold you for an extended period of time or prolonged period of time without at least reasonable suspicion that you committed an immigration offense or violated federal law. Okay? That's, I think, an important rule. If you are held at the checkpoint for more, uh, for more than brief questioning, you can ask the agent if you're free to leave. Um, I think that's an important question to ask because it kind of puts the agent on the spot and forces the agent to make a decision. Is there a detention or seizure actually occurring here? Uh, and if he says yes, then there, you know, you're right, you have various rights thereafter. And if he says that he is not making a decision, you are not detained, then you are actually free to go. It's a very important question to ask. Go to the next slide. Uh, as I said before, under the Fourth Amendment, the primary purpose of the checkpoint, as well as any dog sniffs that occur, must be immigration related. This is uh, the result of a, a, a piece of litigation back in 2000. Uh, but nonetheless, Border Patrol checkpoints often appear to be operated for drug interdiction or generalized crime prevention and not with the primary purpose of verifying citizenship. So this is what the court concluded in our case about the August 2017 checkpoint. The court said, it is patently clear that the primary purpose of the Woodstock Police Department being present at the checkpoint in August was to accept the illegal drugs uh, confiscated by CPB searches in order to prosecute the defendants on state drug charges. Now, you won't know this just from reading that quote, but when they say illegal drugs, we're talking about small, small, small amounts of marijuana, right? All of our clients are not, this isn't a drug trafficking thing, right? These individuals had, uh, are alleged to have had personal amount of uses of marijuana. They were charged with violation level offenses, okay? So for those folks, for the lawyers in the room, you know that that's not even a, a criminal, criminal level offense. It's effectively a civil, uh, uh, viewed as a civil offense. So there's been some misinformation in the press about that, so I thought I'd get it out there. You always have the right to remain silent. I'm going to say that again. You always have the right to remain silent. However, if you don't answer questions to establish your citizenship, uh, if you don't do that, uh, immigration officials may detain you longer in order to verify your immigration status. But this is key. 
This detention is still supposed to be brief under U.S. Supreme Court case law, in particular the Martinez Forte decision I'm talking about. It cannot be prolonged. And your silence isn't your silence alone isn't enough to arrest, detain, or search you. Our view is that a border patrol cannot identify the person's status during this brief period of time. Then CPB must let the person go. Again, under the Martinez Forte decision, you can only detain someone for a brief period of time. Silence alone doesn't give them the authority to prolong that detention. You can go to the next slide. We're seeing, what we're seeing are instructions to the, that, that are contrary to this by Border Patrol. We saw this during the Father's Day checkpoints. CPB's instructions to motorists flagrantly violate these principles. For example, uh, during the Father's Day checkpoint, one CPB agent told the driver, quote, if you're not going to answer my questions, I'm going to, uh, going to have you sit here until you're ready to answer my questions. I'm going to need you to answer my questions before you can go. So what's the threat here, right? If you invoke your right to remain silent, I'm going to seize you and detain you indefinitely. What are they trying to do here? Coerce you, right, to relinquish your right to remain silent. This is a pretty intimidating thing to say, by the way, right? Can you imagine, for those folks who are at the checkpoint, I'm sure you can imagine, but for most of you who weren't, you imagined that, right? You're at a secondary inspection area, or you're, you're actually in the freeway, you have hundreds of cars behind you. You're being told, if you don't answer, it's going to effectively arrest you for, you know, an arrest could mean, you know, a seizure for eight, nine hours. Uh, in some instances, what Border Patrol were saying is that we're going to detain you for as long as the checkpoint's in operation. Um, who knows how long that will be, right? They don't advertise when they're going to shut them down. So uh, this is an unlawful instruction, and it is a coercive instruction. As I said, it's designed to have individuals who relinquish their rights, and it's designed to basically force people to cooperate with what they're doing. That's what's going on here. The next slide. Not answering Border Patrol's questions is a real personal choice. So we're not instructing people to, to not answer questions. Okay, This is a decision that you all have to make for yourselves. What our goal here uh, is to just inform you about what your rights are uh, so you can make an informed decision uh, that comports with your philosophy or your personal circumstances. You should note, of course, that if you uh, decline to answer Border Patrol's questions, it could prolong your seizure. Even though Border Patrol is acting unlawfully in doing so, right? They should still only briefly detain you in attempts to independently verify your status. Um, but you should know that there is a risk that they will violate those principles and detain you for a significant or prolonged period of time beyond the brief period of time that's allowed under law. Um, if you decline to answer and Border Patrol prolongs your detention in an attempt to, deter to determine your status, I'm going to throw an example out here in excess of 15 minutes. We know of one instance, because I know he's here today, I'm not going to call him out, of a prolonged detention occurring around, around 30 minutes. Uh, I'd like to know if that's okay. So if you, you are, if you decide to invoke your right, and again, a personal choice, I'm not instructing you to do that decision for you to make, but if you decide to invoke your right um, and you are detained for an extended period of time, please contact my office. If you decide to answer questions, never lie. It's a crime. Immigration at ACLU. How to contact us? Immigration. Yes, yes. You can contact my personal, I, these slides I'll make available. Uh, my email address is at the end of it. Um, and also immigration. Uh, very simple, uh, immigration at ACLU-NH, that, that goes, that dot org goes right to my inbox, I think, so you can use that too. Um, you may video or audio record federal agents so long as you do not interfere with your work. So it's okay to record these interactions, and I should tell you that they've been immensely valuable to my organization in finding out kind of what happens at these checkpoints. Uh, I really, uh, I can't imagine how we all did this work, frankly, before video. Uh, uh, because you really can't argue with the evidence when you have, uh, when you have uh, video of, of, of how law enforcement are behaving. But uh, a few rules of the road for this, because uh, we want to make sure no one gets in trouble. It's advisable that if, if you have a passenger with you, 
if the passenger were court. Um, we don't want an immigration official thinking there's a perceived safety issue uh, uh, if the motorist is doing things with his or her hands. So I think having uh, a passenger do it, or alternatively, uh, using a dash cam device, I think is an appropriate way of doing it. We also have, we have a hands-free law, right, in New Hampshire, so I don't want people to be breaking that law as well. So uh, I think uh, that's, that's, the, that's my recommendation with respect to recording if you want to go do that process. Also, never flee a checkpoint. Uh, it's a felony. So if you're instructed to go to a secondary area, do it. If you're instructed to uh, get out of the car so they conduct the conduct search, even though you haven't consented, and even though you think the, the search is unconstitutional, respond to those instructions. Comply with those instructions. But remember, you always have a right to what? What am I about to say? Remain silent. Okay. What's a good way, I just, you know, just to kind of give you an example, because I saw this in some of the videos, how do you invoke your right not to comply? Like, other, rather than just say, like, rather than just sitting there and actually literally being silent. So, a couple examples. Um, uh, you could say, I'm invoking my right to remain silent, and that's it. You could say, I'm not going to answer any questions today. Um, and so, we're going to do some hypotheticals in just a few minutes just about what that looks like, but there's some great videos, not only of what occurred here in New Hampshire, but when these checkpoints occur elsewhere. You can see how people do it, but I think the best way to do it is don't get into a confrontation. Don't argue about what the law is. Don't get into a debate. That No one wins those debates. There's a huge power imbalance in this type of situation, right? And, you know, I'm a lawyer, and I think it's intimidating, even myself, right? It's, so uh, the way to do it, and again, a personal choice for, for all the folks in this room and for all the folks that are watching this is being recorded. Um, you know, if it's something that you would want to do for various reasons, uh, I think it's just that simple. You know, I, uh, I'm invoking my right to remain silent. Uh, I, you know, I'm not going to answer any questions today. You're going to be asked the same question three or four times, right? They don't just stop, right, folks? <laughs> Uh, they're going to keep asking the questions. They're going to say, uh, and in fact, I saw it in one of the videos. Well, it's a simple question. Come on, it's a simple question. Um, and they're just going to, they'll just keep going. They'll keep going. Um, but you have a right to not answer. You just keep saying the same thing. That's all you got to do. Keep saying the same thing if that's the choice that you want to make. I'm invoking my right to remain silent. Uh, I'm not going to answer any questions. I'm not going to answer any questions. You're going to sound like a broken record, and it's weird, right? Because that's not how you normally interact with folks, but that's what you do. You just say the same thing. They're going to, they're going to ask you questions like, uh, is this your car, uh, Mr. Jones? I'm not going to answer any questions. Why would they ask, is this your car? Does anyone know? Yeah. Yes. So uh, we'll get into this in the role play. But if you don't answer questions, what they'll do is, uh, we think, <laughs> is they'll run the license plates, find out who the owner is, run, the, uh, run that name through their system. So they'll know, say for example, okay, the owner is Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones has status. So then I'm trying to figure out if you're Mr. Jones. And if you, and if you are Mr. Jones and acknowledge you're Mr. Jones, you'll be free to go. Right? Um, so they'll ask questions like that. You know, Mr. Jones, is this your car? And then you say yes. And then you're free to go. <laughs> so they they figured it out, right? <laughs> so that's one of the tricks that that's one of the tricks that they use. You should all be aware of. Uh, next slide. Role play. I, I didn't realize it was right away. That's kind of great. Uh, should we do? Do you want to we'll do questions after? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Great. So we're gonna do uh, three scenarios. So the first scenario will be where we answer the questions, uh, whatever questions they ask. The second scenario will be, um, we will also answer the questions, but uh, we answer it with, you know, we're not citizens. And then the last scenario will be, you know, probably what a lot of people are interested in, um, will be not answering the questions and uh, evoking the right to, to remain silent. Okay. Can we use this chair? Mm -hmm. Do Uh, Am I involved in this? I forgot. Uh, I think, <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, okay. We're doing the commentary. Yeah. Okay. Great. I forgot the script. <laughs> and this is our, our Know Your Rights. I Know My Rights Mobile. So. 
Okay. And I'll, so I'll play the, the Customs and Border Patrol uh, officer, or Customs and Border Protection officer. Allison here is the driver, and then we also have a passenger. Great. Okay, so Allison has just pulled up to the checkpoint, and I'm approaching the, the vehicle. She's come to a stop, and I'm approaching the vehicle. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Doing good. Are you a U.S. citizen? Yes. Great. And uh, what about you? Yes. Okay, sure. We'll go, go on ahead. All right, we see a lot of these videos. <laughs> <laughs> and this is actually how it should go, okay? And um, so, uh, you know, you've answered the questions. You are a U.S. citizen. Uh, they've done the inquiry under Martinez Fuerte. They've gotten the answer. They don't have a basis to further detain you. And, uh, you know, you should be free to go. Um, now, they could send you to a secondary inspection area here, but even then, I don't, you know, for, for what purpose? <laughs> um, uh, but they could continue the detention, though very briefly, in the secondary inspection area to, to verify that. Um, it doesn't, I don't think, happen all the time, but you just know that that's certainly a possibility, and they may run their name through the system. But most often, when the question's answered, yes, and it needs to be a truthful answer, because you should never lie, because that's the, that's the commission of a crime, they'll allow you to just uh, keep on moving. There's a question in the back. Yeah, so, kind of what question, aren't they supposed to look at your identification first before they talk to you? Isn't No, no. And in fact, they don't, uh, you don't need to, as a United States citizen, you don't have to have your passport on you, right, <laughs> as you're traveling. That's not a requirement. Um, yeah, not yet. <laughs> That's a good point. So, no, they won't ask for your passport. Um, there is a question about whether they can ask for ID. Um, it, I, I haven't seen it in the videos with respect to uh, the New Hampshire checkpoint. I would argue that that's not permissible. Uh, you know, the Martinez Forte decision talks about, you know, an inquiry, asking questions as to status. That's what they're allowed to do. That's what happened here. The questions were answered. That person should be free to go. Again, what immigration officials aren't, their purpose is not to enforce state laws concerning whether individuals are driving with driver's licenses, right? That's not their job. They're not designed to, they're not there to enforce those state laws. Um, have they asked in the past in other states? I'm sure they have. If they do ask, you know, that's something that I would want to look into to see whether or not we have a concern with that. But in New Hampshire, uh, at least I, I am not aware of that question being asked. But for those folks who went through the checkpoint, uh, raise your hands again if you went through the checkpoint. Did they ask for identification? No. What did they say? Was, was it, are you a US, U.S. citizen? No. You say yes and you're free to go? That was, uh, the first two times we got stopped, it was just, are you U.S. citizens? They asked that to be person in the car, and we were allowed through. The last time they were just slowing everyone down and looking. Okay, Let's, I want to talk about that. Uh, yes. With what, what was everyone else, and if you're willing to talk, and you don't have to, of course, but what, what was everyone else's experience? Different? Any different? Um, Colombia, 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 Say that again? Got it. Okay. And anyone else in the back? Yep. Okay. So there's, again, I'm not going to, with respect to citizens, as I said, you don't have to have a U.S. passport on you. You don't have to have proof of citizenship on you. There are some classes of folks, and it is, complicated in the weeds, and again, I'm not going to get into it here. I have individuals who do have to have that with them, but I'll, I'll kind of leave that for another day. What I'm very interested in as well, this is so great to have this many people uh, who went through the checkpoint because I can learn about what's happening. I'm very interested in the waving system that may occur when traffic starts to get backed up and Border Patrol wants to kind of more easily facilitate the checkpoint. How do they when they elect to, well, you know what, I'm not going to ask this question of every car. I'm just going to selectively decide who to ask this question to. I think, uh, I don't think it would be inappropriate to be suspicious 
about the criteria that's used in making those judgments <laughs> about uh, which cars to stop. And you know, we have, I think, a good example here of reason to be suspicious. Yeah. Just a technical thing. When you get a question from the back, can you restate it? Oh, sure. Time? Sure, sure. Sorry, sorry about that. Yep. So it's clear we don't have to answer a question, but they demand ID, do we have to show ID? So uh, I, I don't think it's under the law, at least not clear to me what the answer is. And so I, I'm not going to make a recommendation one way or the other there. I, there's a, a part of me that thinks it's not necessarily appropriate, as I said before, because they're not there to investigate state law concerning driver's licenses, right? They don't need a driver's license to establish your citizenship. They can ask you. Right? which is what Martinez Forte talks about. And I think that's why, in most instances, though there's some exceptions here, that they're simply asking people, are they U.S. citizens, rather than asking for ID. Because again, their job is not to enforce state uh, driver's license laws. Uh, yeah. the, uh, the question there was, could they just demand identification? Yeah. And you have a right to, you know, sorry, go on. Yeah. So, What was the question? Do you need to disclose that you're reporting to the officer? That's a great question. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, some federal officials may disagree. I litigated this case here in New Hampshire about the right to secretly record uh, out of Manchester. Here are the rules with respect to recording. You have, uh, the question was, uh, for those folks who are watching, do you have to disclose that you're recording? You have a First Amendment right to record if you are recording a law enforcement officer performing their official duties in public so long as you uh, do so without interfering with their, the performance of their duties. So here, you're recording a federal immigration official performing their duties in public. They're out in public view. Uh, and you're, if you're doing it without interfering and doing it in a way that doesn't cause the federal immigration official to believe that there are safety concerns, then our argument is that our belief is that you have a First Amendment right to do it. So my recommendation, I think using a dash cam is, is probably the safest way, one of the safest ways to do it. So if they're using local law Uh, good question. I want to think about that. I think my initial instinct would be no, right? Because these, the question is if local law enforcement are collaborating with federal immigration officials at these checkpoints, would that give, uh, would, would that give, enhance the ability for local law enforcement as part of these checkpoints to ask for ID? My argument would be no. And why is that? And that's because, as I said before, the primary purpose of these checkpoints is supposed to be immigration related. So there, you would have basically state law enforcement bootstrapping off the backs of, of these checkpoints. And I think that would probably be inappropriate, especially after the, the decision that we litigated concerning docs and the searches. I'm going to do one more question, then I want to get to the next. There'll be time for questions after, but I want to get to the next uh, scenario. One last question. Representative Hines. I guess my concern <laughs> is... Yeah. Can you repeat that? So the, the, the concern from, uh, uh, the concern is that if you're, dis are you disobeying an officer by not producing uh, identification uh, under state law? The interesting thing about that would be to what extent would, it, if that's true, and I want to look at that statute further, to what extent would it be appropriate for federal immigration officials to enforce that law in the context of these immigration checkpoints? So let's go to the next one. All right, so this scenario is um, they'll answer the questions and they aren't uh, US citizens, so. Great, so they pull up. Hey, how's it going today? Hey, good, how are you? Good, good. Uh, are y'all US citizens? No. No? Okay, I'm gonna have you uh, pull over here and turn your car off and then uh, we're gonna run your, your names to the immigration database and uh, we'll get back to you, all right? So just sit tight. So this is gonna create a basis for further detention. Simply, if you, remember, just because you're not a U.S. citizen doesn't mean you're here unlawfully, right? 
So these, they're gonna, now it's going to be a process to try to verify the identities of the individuals in the car to see whether they're here unlawfully. So they're going to run their names through the system, make some sort of assessment. If there's an assessment uh, that the individuals are here unlawfully, those individuals are then going to be sent to Stratford County Jail. Um, and uh, let's, go, let's go to the next one. Yep. And then this last scenario is um, them invoking their right to uh, not answer any questions. Hey, how's it going today? Good, how are you? Good, uh, are you a U.S. citizen? I'm not going to answer any questions today. Okay, well, we're going to have you pull over to the side uh, of the road over here and uh, turn off your car, and you're just going to you're going to be there until you uh, answer our questions, all right? Am I being detained? Uh, yes, you are. Okay. Great, so, uh, yeah, if I could have you pull over, please. So at this point, you're being pulled over. The CPB officer, they're going to run your license plates to see who owns the car that's being driven. They'll try to confirm that you're the owner of the vehicle using various tricks that we talked about, and if they're able to get your name, they're then going to run your name uh, through the database to determine, to determine whether you have citizenship. So why don't you continue on, Officer Great. Dan. So, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Schwartz, are you still going to refuse to answer any questions? I refuse to answer any questions. So you are Allison? I'm not going to answer any questions today. But you did answer to, to Ms. Schwartz, didn't you? I'm not going to answer any questions. <laughs> That's good. Is your, is your friend Ms. Schwartz here always this difficult? <laughs> She's not All right. Any questions. <laughs> well, well, are you a U.S. citizen, ma'am? I'm not going to answer any questions. All right. Well, you're you're both going to sit here until you answer any question. Uh, answer my questions. All right. Okay. We'll be here. Are you all U.S. citizens? I'm not going to answer any questions. Sorry. Okay. Well, you're gonna you're gonna sit here on the, until the checkpoint's over. All right. So they'll send you to a secondary inspection area. They'll put. Um, strips uh, underneath your tires <laughs> so if you decide to move your car your tires will deflate uh, and you'll sit there um, again under the law it still should only be brief but if, you know who knows uh, how long the detention will be and so that's a great example thank you both so much for uh, <laughs> it's a great example uh, how to invoke your rights in this type of situation. So uh, this concludes the presentation, and I'm happy to answer questions. I'm sure there are a lot of them. I may not be able to answer all of them. I think the driver's license question, to me, is a challenging one. Um, and you know, I'm not necessarily confident in what the right answer is. And so just to be clear, uh, you know, it, it's very much a personal choice uh, with respect to how you decide to respond to law enforcement. But just recognizing if you decide not to turn your license over, that you decide not to give your identity, as we just just saw moments ago, uh, you know you're going to be detained, uh, and it should be brief, but not always. Yes, right here. So if uh, if you are detained and uh, you're left to sit there for 30, 45 minutes an hour, would it be um, would it be useful uh, to to let them know that you? that you realize that that's not, that that's not legal for them to detain you that long? Uh, I, don't, I don't think it would be useful, to be honest. They're not going to listen to you. <laughs> and I do worry that, especially when you're evoking your right to remain silent, that that is going to create yet a further interaction with law enforcement in which that law enforcement agent is now going to continue or reinitiate efforts uh, to try to get you to, co uh, to comply. Uh, and so that's just something, listen, again, it's a personal choice. You can volunteer that if you like. I don't, it's not clear to me that it will lead to, that will necessarily help facilitate a positive outcome, however. Uh, uh, to your right, next question, yes. If one person in the car is very sick and they're being driven to a hospital or to a doctor, how would, they res how would, how would that affect the response to the checkpoint? Does that person have status? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> I don't know the answer. Can you repeat the question? Uh, the, the question is if there's someone who's sick or ill and be you know, going to the hospital, how would that affect Border Patrol? Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, do you have the authority uh, under uh, a set of rules that we discussed to stop anyone going through that checkpoint? Um, pursuant to these rules. Our hope would be that uh, federal immigration officials in a situation like that would exercise their discretion in a humane way. 
Uh, I can tell you uh, just from personal experience in representing 50 Indonesians uh, who were slated for deportation without process that, uh, that doesn't always happen. Question right in the back, black shirt. That's a good question. So we, yeah, the question is, does does someone who uh, who doesn't have status have the same right to remain silent as someone who does have legal status? Uh, it's true that federal immigration removal proceedings are not deemed criminal proceedings and they're viewed as administrative proceedings. However, uh, individuals who have crossed uh, the border in violation of the law may have separately committed a crime of unlawful reentry, which is a misdemeanor under our federal criminal laws. And of course, in the context of that criminal proceeding, or in the context uh, of, of facing the prospect of that punishment, that individual would certainly have a right to remain silent. I think our global recommendation is that that right to remain silent, uh, you know, certainly does apply to everyone. Uh, you may hear Border Patrol officials say, uh, well, you know, you don't really have that constitutional right, removal proceedings are administrative, but to the extent that uh, there are federal crimes implicated, uh, concerning a lawful reentry, then absolutely that right to remain silent applies. That question. You probably know more about this than I do, then. <laughs> yep, Martinez Fuerte. Fuerte, yep. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And so for the video, the, the question in a nutshell was, get the word out. Make sure that, that people are informed of Martinez Fuerte or going through these checkpoints. Uh, certainly that's why we're here today. But we have a one-pager, I forgot to mention this at the outset, that we've created that synthesizes all of this, you know, uh, just on, on one document that you can use for your own personal use. I think we have copies up in the front. Uh, keep it in your car if you want. Um, uh, and maybe uh, I can tell you that at these checkpoints, if you don't comply and you're sent to a secondary inspection area, they will sometimes give you reading material about their ability to conduct these checkpoints. And you know, maybe you could you can give them the reading material. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's go in the corner. Yeah. Uh, the the turquoise shirt. How are you? Oh, good. That's you. <laughs> so um, if the announcement of the next checkpoint, we know when it's going to happen, mm -hmm. and say 20 or 30 cars went through the checkpoint and everyone refused to answer, would that be an act of useful civil disobedience? Yes. Or, uh, it's a personal choice. I'm not going uh, to deter or ask individuals to do that. Uh, but it is a personal choice, and if you elect to do that, uh, my job is to let you know what your rights are. And record every. <laughs> That's true. In the in the corner in the college here. Great question. That's it. So the question is: Do do border patrol usually do these checkpoints with local or state police? So before our lawsuit, they would do this in conjunction with local police because the goal, of course, wasn't just immigration related; it was to enforce state drug laws. As a result of our lawsuit. 
that degree of collaboration, it appears, has effectively ended. That is a good thing because, again, federal immigration officials, their job is not enforcing state law, right? It's enforcing federal law, in particular federal immigration law. That said, even notwithstanding that decision, it does look like there's some involvement with the state police in conducting traffic-related uh, issues in advance of the checkpoint. Um, so we've seen a little bit of that. I'm not that surprised by that, um, uh, but what, I think it's a good thing that we're not seeing collaboration with respect to state law drug enforcement. Uh, we have so many questions. This is great. Uh, let's, but let's let's start with the left side of the room, uh, right there. Yes, you. Sorry. <laughs> So what do you do while you're while, while you're waiting? After you're done, now you're calling. You call me. That's what you do. Immigration at aclu-nh.org. Uh, my email is at the end of the slides. Find a way to get a hold of me because this is what we're trying to get get to the bottom of. Uh, right here. How are you, sir? Uh, good. If you just stop me a few last questions. And they suspect that you are not a citizen. What are they allowed to do other than let you go? Um, and on, on what basis? They, sus they suspect that you're not a citizen. You said nothing. You said nothing. What are they allowed to do? What can they say? Well, um, there's a concern that you know profiling is occurring. You know we certainly believe at the ACLU that you can't just look at someone, and that would create a reasonable basis to think someone is not a U.S. citizen. There's what what they really can do is what I talked about, which is they can ask you to move to a secondary inspection area, and do the best they can, right? Which is run the name of whoever owns the car, see if they can place that name with someone that's in the car and perform whatever other tricks that are lawfully up their sleeve. Uh, but aside from that, we don't think they can profile. We don't think they can make judgments or should be able to make judgments based on accents or how people look, uh, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, that's certainly the ACLU's position. And I think, you know, particularly if you're an individual that may not have status and are concerned, you know, invoking your right to remain silent, I think, is important. Put the burden on them. That's their job, right? It's their job to figure it out. And if you have concerns or issues about your status, you don't need to volunteer. Let them do their job. Um, white shirt in the back. Great question. Question is, what happens when individuals are on public transportation? So we've seen this a little bit. Uh, not as much in New Hampshire, thankfully, but we are actively monitoring this. Uh, I want to talk about two situations with public transit. One occurred recently in Maine where individuals were in a public bus station lining up to go on a bus. And while they were lining up, there were Border Patrol officials asking individuals whether they were U.S. citizens or not. So that's not a checkpoint situation, right? That's a situation where immigration officials are just in a public place asking individuals whether they have status. You're not actually being seized, as you are in it being a checkpoint. Uh, you're not detained. So you actually have even greater rights in that situation, right? Because you are free to go. You don't need to say a thing. You are in a public place. And there was an issue with respect to the Concord Coach video that came out out of Bangor because in error, the bus driver was saying that you need to be a U.S. citizen to board the bus. Let me just put that to rest. That is false. That is not true. Concord Coach walked that back with a statement saying, you know, he made a mistake. Separately, what we've seen, we saw it in Vermont during the summer of 2017, where buses were being stopped. And this is something that we have tremendous concerns with. The ACLU's position is that buses do not need to allow immigration officials inside. Why? That is not a public place, right? When you're inside a bus, that area is limited to individuals who are ticketed passengers. And so we have been doing advocacy trying to get these buses to take the position that they don't need to, they don't need to consent 
to allow immigration officials on the buses. So we haven't seen it in New Hampshire yet. If it does happen here, we'll obviously, you know, be, be willing to take a stand. Yeah. Uh, let's. Uh, uh, yes, right there, Blue Shirt. How are you? Hi. Uh, can you please define the legal term status? Status. Uh, so, someone, I think what I meant is someone is here lawfully, whether they're a U.S. citizen, green card holder, visa holder, etc. So that's what I meant by that status. Someone who's here, here who has status. Uh, yes, how are you? Um, it, it's hard to pick people out without knowing that. <laughs> and I'm like colorblind, so I can't identify. <laughs> so if, if someone who is here legally, mm -hmm. you know, they're asked, are you a citizen? They're going to say, no, I'm not. If they choose to answer the question, Mm -hmm. Then, Border Patrol is going to verify that, probably. So are people now required, if they're legal, legally here, are they now required to carry proof of that wherever they go all the time? No, no. There are some, uh, some limited groups of individuals that do have status, that are here legally, that do. That is a minority. I can kind of get into the legal weeds of that. But most people that have status, uh, who, are, who are, have status and who aren't even necessarily U.S. citizens, but are here legally, don't have to hold on and keep their papers with them all the time under the law. So what happens to them at these stops? Well, so it's a great question. <laughs> so if they say, so they're usually asked, are you a U.S. citizen? So these individuals would be saying, if they wanted to comply, right, they would say no. They would be sent to a secondary uh, inspection area, and then they'd be subsequently asked, you know, well, what's your name? And if they again wanted to continue complying because they, you know, have status here even though they're not a U.S. citizen, they would give their name. There's a database. They would run it through the database, and then they'd be allowed to leave once that verification process occurs. That's how it would work. So, yes. Uh, you do uh, again query whether it's uh, the question is sorry the question is if you're pulled over do you have the right to ask why you're being pulled over uh, certainly you can I don't know how productive it necessarily will be sometimes even before you say anything they're going to say immigration checkpoint you know as if they're kind of flagging for you why they're detaining you are you a U.S. citizen uh, I mean you can ask what they I presume will say it's an immigration checkpoint. I'm here all day. So. <laughs> Come back. Sure, no problem. We got two more in the corner. How are you? Yep. So let's say I'm here not legally. I don't have papers. I get stopped at an immigration checkpoint, and I exercise my right to not say anything. At the end of the day, do they just have to send me home? Let's let's home as in they have to let you go. Have to let you go. This is a great question. Okay, and this is why when I say. Uh, you have a right to remain silent, it's important because even in that type of situation, our belief is that under Martinez Fuerte, they can't prolong your detention because they don't have a reason, they don't have a basis, they don't have reasonable suspicion or probable cause to believe you're here lawfully. So they have a brief period of time now to try to figure that out. And if they can't, silence doesn't create the basis to prolong a detention. So, you know, they'll send you to a secondary inspection area, and then it's incumbent upon them to try to make that assessment. Again, they are going to, they're not just going to ask you that question, you say no, and then they're just going to ignore you. They're going to keep peppering you. Simple question. It's an easy question. And a lot of times individuals give up, and they do disclose that information. Sometimes individuals want to, they, you know, they feel like they have to. Um, but I think it's important for those individuals as well to know their rights, because really it should be, I think, incumbent upon immigration officials to, uh, for those individuals who want to invoke their rights, for immigration officials to sort it out and figure out for themselves whether an individual has status. Yes? Um, two questions. If we're on a bus, and we're at a bus station or a train station, and we see immigration officials, can we loudly say to everyone, you don't have to answer any questions? Yes. Just inform everybody in a really, really loud voice. The second is. I think that's great. And the, 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 let's, before I get to the second question, 
Uh, if, if you're on a bus, or I presume even in a public bus station, and you see this occurring, can you let people know that they have a right uh, not to answer questions? Uh, I think that's a good thing. Uh, uh, again, I wouldn't get into a debate <laughs> with Border Patrol officials. Uh, they may say they disagree with you. Uh, but I, I think uh, just making that statement, I think, is something that uh, isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, and you, if you go to some of the bus stations now in New Hampshire and in New England, there are some, in English and in Spanish, some Know Your Rights posters that the ACLU has been posting. Uh, uh, so people know this, know what their rights are. Uh, and our position as well, in those situations, that it should be incumbent upon the bus companies as well to educate uh, passengers and let them know what their rights are. These are paying customers, they should protect their customers. Uh, the second question, of course. The second question is, so if we refuse, someone like me refuses to answer, I figure I'll be racially profiled and I'll be put aside, but I keep refusing to answer. Since I am a citizen, they will have to let me go? They won't be able to do anything about it after a while? Well, this is a great question. When we, the question is, well, you know, I'm, uh, I may be racially profiled, uh, I'm a U.S. citizen, but if I decide not to answer, you know, they'll hold me. How long will they hold me? I assume at some point they'd have to let me go. I don't know what they'll do. <laughs> I can tell you what your rights are in that situation. But if you decide not to comply for your own personal reasons, even though you're a U.S. citizen, your detention should still be brief. And they have that brief period of time to try to make that determination. If they can't make it during that brief time, they have to let you go. They're not allowed to prolong your detention. Silence isn't a basis to prolong detention. Will they comply with those rules? No. I don't know. <laughs> so you've indicated that they could probably hold you indefinitely. And, and what are the ramifications? Well, I, I've intimated that because that's the threat <laughs> that we've seen, right? Uh, there's a video, uh, it's on our website, right? The, the seven minute video. It's on that, Facebook. It's on Facebook. So on the ACLU of New Hampshire's Facebook page, there's a video um, that we put together um, that uh, has some commentary similar to the commentary I've given today, combined with video clips of the Father's Day checkpoint, um, where I talk about this a bit because we have kind of a mashup of, of three clips from the Father's Day checkpoint in which Border Patrol officials were telling individuals who were invoking their right not to comply that we were going to detain you indefinitely. So, it's not an insinuation, I think it's what's being told to individuals, and I just think it's important for folks to know what their rights are, and that that is not an appropriate instruction under the law. That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, you know, I would like to believe that in that situation, if say the driver is the only one that really can meaningfully engage in translation, that the border patrol agent would permit that. Um, but I don't know. They have a lot of discretion, unfortunately, and um, you know, I wouldn't have a job if if government officials didn't sometimes abuse their power. So, um, you know. Uh, let me just say, I hope that the discretion would be used appropriately there. I'm just not so sure it happens all the time. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. So we'll go right here. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it was in the ACLU of California. I actually had an app that you can get through Android that when you get it, you'll automatically start recording and upload it to their servers in case something happens. We should get that. That's what I was going to say. It's, you know, um, I, the question was, uh, the ACLU of California has an app where you record something that automatically gets sent to the ACLU. Um, uh, with the checkpoints, I might, be, I might be an internal advocate for something like that, because it could be an easy way to get information. So we have one more question. The other question, any other questions individuals have, I'm happy to take after. I'm here all night, folks. Um, so I'm going to do a question in the red in the back. Banners or have signs at exits or have signs in our cars that say you have the right to remain silent, you do not have to answer 
checkpoint questions and make very public ahead of checkpoints off 93, not interfering with the checkpoint itself, we could publicly do yeah. that. Yes, you could. The question is, you know, if there is a checkpoint, they usually happen in three-day increments. So a checkpoint occurs on a Friday. What we've seen based on the last four is that that usually means there'll then be one on Saturday, and there'll, there'll then be one on Sunday. Uh, question is, can we do advocacy on, in or around Highway 93, uh, and I assume as well on social media, letting folks know? The answer is absolutely. You should know that that at some point. On I-93, they start blocking off pedestrian traffic, okay? Um, and at some point, it becomes a futile exercise because there's no ability for an individual to actually turn around, right? So this is an opportunity for individuals who want to do that to maybe set up shop at the, the prior accident, the prior exit. So you could inform individuals this is occurring. If you don't want to partake in what at least I view as a significant intrusion in your civil liberties. Um, you know, maybe you want to get off at the prior exit. And so setting up shop at the prior exit may not be necessarily a bad idea as well. Or informing people who are entering from that exit onto 93 South, letting them know what they're about to face, that type of advocacy and information as well could be useful. Let me just say, uh, again, I'm, I'll, I'll stay here for as long as it takes to get questions answered. These slides are available. We'll make them public. We have a one-pager in the back. I want to thank you all so, so much for coming. This is so important, um, and it's, it's a, it was such a joy and privilege to, to talk about these issues today. Some of these issues are hard, so I, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then on that, the note of uh, being notified of checkpoints, so um, if you signed in, you might have noticed a column where it says notif to be notified about checkpoints. If you check mark that column, I'll opt you into a system where we'll send text alerts and an email alert on the second we find out about a checkpoint. Um, so if you didn't get a chance to, to sign in with that, uh, just come see me. I think I pulled the We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.